welcome to episode 10 of the Career Musician Podcast by Nomad. I am your host, and today I am speaking with Jason Moss, music business mogul, composer, producer, songwriter, guitarist, extraordinaire, and all-around good dude. Originally hailing from New Jersey, it was out on the East Coast that Jason cut his teeth learning how to shred on guitar, compose, produce, write, and even did a stint at Sam Mash selling what else but guitars. Eventually, he made his way to Tempe, Arizona for the burgeoning music scene there, where he fully immersed himself in commercial multimedia music production. He was also the music director for a local TV network. As if that weren't enough, Jason had his sights set all the way out west to the left coast where he came to make Magic Hour, his first solo record, hiring A-list LA session cats and a producer. He did just that. Now, as the owner and CEO of Supersonic Noise, a boutique library company here in Los Angeles, he licenses thousands of music cues on a daily basis. Additionally, he's a co-founder of Bulletproof Bear, a music licensing company that also does music supervision, various production and consulting work, and has its own record label division. The bottom line, Jason Moss is no slacker. Just take a listen and see how he has maximized his full potential as a career musician. We are here once again at Nomad's Place, the official brick and mortar location <laughs> in sunny Burbank, California. And I am here with my good friend and amazing freaking musicoid business guy, guitar guy, creative guy, composer guy, publishing guy, music supervisor guy, Woo. Jason Moss, a.k.a. J-Mo. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody, you're going to have to post some photos. Yes. On you, Because this place is... Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. You are from? Uh, grew up in New Jersey, Bergen County, when I was 13, to Caracas, Venezuela, for almost four years. I forgot about that. That's yeah, cool. then back to Jersey for a year, then up to state New York for a year, then back to Jersey for college, then Phoenix, Arizona, then now LA. Come on, give me some, bro. Another yeah. fellow nomad. That's the whole yeah. the premise behind yeah, this that's concept. Interesting. Because we're all nomads, music people and artistic people in general. We are all nomadic by nature. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, it was like uh, uh, after I got out of school and, you know, I was still had long hair and I still had hair, period. <laughs> and I was selling guitars at Sam Ash, you know, nice. and you're like, I'm trying to break into the commercial industry in New York doing jingles and singing and stuff like trying to still be a rock star. You're like maybe I should get out of New York and be a big fish in a small pond. The whole scene was blowing up in Phoenix and in Tempe. Um, and I was, they, he's like, hey, I went to school there. Let's move over there. And we're like, should we go there or Nashville? Like, Nashville's too crowded. Let's go to Phoenix. And so I went there for almost four years. How did that work? So you're the big fish in a smaller pond. And what line of, of uh, music industry did you find yourself in? How did you immerse? Uh, well, I was still trying to be a, so a songwriter, do albums, get a record deal. That whole thing was still big. Uh, as an artist. Yeah, as an artist. But I was in New York. I was, you know, interning and working for some music houses. So, of course, the TV commercial thing was still in my mind. And I still wanted to do. I was fascinated with TV commercials. I just like mm. loved TV. To me, I didn't think about film. I and think about TV writing I, I, or production music. I didn't even know what production music was at that time. I just wanted to be a TV composer for TV commercials. Wow. I wanted to write Snickers commercials and freaking tampon commercials. I don't give a shit. I just wanted to write commercials. In New York, I was doing some jingle singing and some demoing. But when I moved to Phoenix, I ended up actually starting to work for a music educational network. So it was like Sesame Street meets the Discovery Channel. EMG, Educational Management Group, and it became Planet Think. It was owned by Simon & Schuster. So we were doing um, educational programming beamed directly into schools, live shows, uh, wow. live curriculum. And uh, I actually got hired to surf the web for porn sites so they can block the porn sites in 96... Wow before really internet was just blowing up okay. and all these shit was popping up all over the internet and yeah. they said so we want you to basically build html pages so we can make sure we can block them then i start i saw opportunity and so i was like hey you you're writing some song you need some songs for children's programming i could write song children's songs i could write kids songs sure 
Uh, then, you know, they needed documentary underscore. Then they needed, they just started needing a whole bunch of things. And I started putting myself in the middle of that. At the same time, doing commercials in Phoenix for like the casinos. And nice. I, I got a mentor. At, at the end of the day, when uh, three or four years after I ended up becoming the music director for this, the network ended up selling again to uh, Pearson. And, you know, I really cut my teeth, learned a lot in Phoenix and all these different ways. And so already you, you go to this smaller town and, and already you're, you're finding yourself with a multitude of, of, of job titles. Yeah, so, actually, yeah, know, I was doing a lot for that. I was producing programming. I was on air talent. I was doing music shows. I was, you know, I was setting out FedExes. I mean, I was like, I was like, you know, I had like 20 jobs for them. Once again, as musicians, that is, I think that goes with the territory where we just have to do so much on a daily basis. Slices of your pie. You got to have a lot of slices of pie. There you go. You know, you to go. this day. You have slices of pie, I have slices of pie. Right. You know, maybe we've refined our, our skill set a little bit, but diversity, you know, to me is, a, is an asset, not necessarily a hindrance. I always say it, diversity is key to success and longevity in this business. Perhaps a lot of us start out playing one particular instrument or several for that matter not even knowing all of the other facets of the creative aspects that we're capable of. Take stock and see how you can diversify in your own career. So expound on that because uh, you know the old saying, you're jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. I think that whole paradigm is being turned on its head now, especially with the information age that we live in, mm -hmm. right? Let's say, for instance, as, as, a, as a music guy that we are, oh, I need a website. Well, now, I, we, I used to contract people out to build my websites. Mm -hmm. Now you can literally do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And as much as I don't like spending the time to do it, the reality is if you go spend 20 grand on a website, by contracting it out, that's kind of silly because you could right. do it on your own, right? Absolutely. So, so, so how do you feel about that? The, again, this paradigm shift, and do you concur? You know, and, and how do you? Second part of the question is how do you devise your schedule? I try and do as much as I can myself. Musically speaking, I, I, I'm a guitar centric player. I, I like uh, writing other kinds of music. I, I would say I do stuff pretty well. I always thought philosophically, surround uh, yourself with more talented and better people than yourself. Amen. You okay. know, play tennis with a better tennis player, you become a better tennis player. Um, I, I don't have an ego about, I want to learn from smart people. I want to surround myself with, with smarter people, you know, more talented people and I'll put in what I can and interject a little bit of what I know and hopefully it'll come out better than if I just did it myself. Possibly. So the collaborative effort is still, because I believe the same thing, it still brings about a really good result. I mean, yeah. You know, again, especially people who are more talented in certain areas. And, yeah. I mean, I like playing with keyboard players and people that may be more orchestral or jazz. They have a different headspace than guitar players or even guitar players that are um, like you. You come from a slightly different sort of guitar centric, you know. Uh, background, you're di really diverse in all these different Latin American styles and right. instruments. I mean, I'm a, at the end of the day, I'm a Ramones three chord punk right. kid. You know, I'm not an educated, uh, schooled um, composer, read and write music. Okay. I'm an ear kid. You right. Know? Right. Um, so if I wrote with you, though, because of your diversity and your experience, we'll still come up with something really unique and cool. But if I was to play with another punk, it's not going to be the kind of diversity and depth, possibly. Right. That uh, you know, I could if I kind of uh, expand my horizons with other people musically. Sure. If yeah. that makes any that sense. That makes perfect sense. Uh, the second part is. Uh, throughout your daily routine, do you set aside time each day to do certain tasks or do you set aside certain days of the week? For instance, I know you're mm -hmm. big in publishing and you probably have to look at a lot of cue sheets. You have to do a lot of administrative work. Yeah. Is there, do you say, oh, every Tuesday I just sit in front of my no, computer and I've do I've never admin. been that guy. I've been just, I'll just do, I'm, I'm also not a procrastinator. Okay, so if I good. can get it done, I'll get it done at that moment. Excellent. And, you know, my thought is, is uh, you know, don't bore us, get to the chorus. And let me get as much shit as I can done. So maybe I'll be done with my day by three or four or five o'clock and then I can go fuck off. You, you know? can go oh, ride said, the bike, go get some whiskey. No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. You know, as I've gotten older, I mean, I still love making music and yeah. I still want to make music, but I love 
just you know, uh, you know, my twenties and thirties were mean. really, really super, just ridiculously focused, okay, and ridiculously like just like a freaking arrow, yeah, and and I I still feel that and want that, but I also like balance, so I feel like the balance feeds my creativity and my passion for for you know being in in the music business because so many things have changed right. about our business. The record labels, the licensing, yes. just the dollars and cents of it. People aren't paying and valuing music like they used to. So we have to work a little hard, a lot harder to make the same buck in 2018 where, man, when I was doing TV commercials, I mean, I'll still do TV commercials now, but when I was doing TV commercials constantly, uh, you know, they were union jobs and the mm. budgets were twice as big and it just was different. You're listening to the Career Musician Podcast by Nomad. You've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. This is a business, ladies and gentlemen. You have to take the time to map out your daily routine. You have to find balance amidst all the daily chores and tasks that we must perform as career musicians. Reinvention, you know, like we said, the industry has changed so much. These are some of your principles and methods you've been talking about this past few minutes. How, what does that mean to you? Because that's obviously what you're talking about. You had to kind of reinvent your process or some things that you were doing or, or, or even how you perceive it. I really haven't tried to reinvent myself or ever attempted to reinvent myself. I feel like I've tried to educate myself. I think I've tried to be a smarter business person uh, in a music industry that is very confusing because it's intellectual property there's there's royalties, there's publishing, there's writers, shares, there's PROs, there's work, there's upfront monies, there's things that are asked for gratis, and there's so many different avenues. So for me, I want to educate myself and have a sense of uh, of pride and respect for what I do, and feel like it's worth getting paid for because I've put the time and effort into become slightly knowledgeable in this area. You know, right. I, there are. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm an expert. You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of baller uh, music executives and music people. And, you know, uh, and you hear some of these stories and they're mind blowing and they're inspirational. And these are the guys that I'm learning from. You know, I'm I'm still younger than them. So they've paved the road, you know, um, listening more than speaking, which is always a struggle. Uh, No ego. um, I work on that all the time because ego just fucks things up, you know. Doesn't it though? It does, it's and it's and it's hard. It's hard to not get in a room and want to talk about yourself. And now everybody with social media, there's a fine line of doing that. There's an authentic way, and then there's a braggadocious bullshit way. Oh, my um, my tagline is always social media. The question is, bragging or branding. That's always that's yeah. how I pose it. Yeah, I, I don't There's really... a fine line. Yeah, I, I post a lot of my photos, my possible work that I do with my companies, but I don't really necessarily post... I don't post photos of me or my wife or talk about Same. me yeah. as like what I'm doing and what I'm yeah. eating and where I'm taking a dump. I don't... You know <laughs> what I mean? What I like about your, your social media streams is they're usually artistic in nature. You're, you're a very visual guy and I love... You're always posting some abstract uh, visual piece that you might have found a mural or maybe a sculpture, I love that about you. you, or something mechanical, you might, you know, post part of a motorcycle that looks really interesting. Yeah, I like know. fucking with my photos. I love that. Doing... Yours literally is like a little plateau of relief. You're like, oh, well, that's nice, thanks for sharing, Jay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> we're, cool. we're being shot at yeah. from all directions, yeah. with everybody saying, look at me, look at me, look at this, look at what this, check this out, but yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, it becomes overloaded. I don't think really anybody, even if you like me, I don't think anybody really cares about what I'm doing in that kind of way. I think yeah. maybe, you know, th- my photography is uh, uh, an expression, and I maybe it gives somebody a, oh, that's cool, or yes. that's beautiful, or that's ugly. Um, cause I think ugly is beautiful. I think scars are sexy. That's right. You know, um, I like that. So, you know, I, that's the name of a band. That could be. <laughs> let's, let's get a let's band together. Let's do it. But, um, I, I feel like, yeah, I just, I want to just try and educate myself. I mean, I, I've, I've always had, um, you know, I've always tried to be a composer, write music for TV and film in advertising so I've always been about that I've been a songwriter I am a songwriter right. my songwriting and my singing is like my artistic you know uh, center 
and then everything stems from that because you know I'm not trying to necessarily um, be a hit songwriter but I still want to write songs because it, it to me the craft and art of writing songs it, I feel the closest to being an artist for art's sake not mm -hmm. to try and yeah. sell though I'd love to be successful as a songwriter right. I, I, I it just you know it still gives me a lot of pleasure. Yeah, we just said that at lunch. Like yeah. we do this because we love it. We have to. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to abandon being an, a songwriter and an artist myself because. But I that love fuels it. you as a composer. Yes. And and also the diversity in styles. Yes. When you're a songwriter, I kind of in a sort of, you know, I'm I'm very sort of in a certain area as a songwriter. I'm a, you know, it's like it's folk, it's rock, it's got a little Americana, it's got a little indie. Okay. But as a composer, I could be writing. A, you know, some sort of trap, EDM track, mm -hmm. or I'm writing something like that might have orchestral elements. I just feel like I could be a chameleon as a composer. But whereas a songwriter, I'm not writing, I'm not singing a metal track and then going to sing a country track. It's pretty right. much, you know, what I do. Is it's a, more focused. Yeah. Let's talk about the nuances and traits of each genre and subgenre within all of the various forms of multimedia use music. For instance, a TV commercial ad might sound totally different than underscore for a dramatic series. Of course, a song on an album will sound completely different from those two examples. Therefore, it's important that we understand the variances. So your first instrument was a guitar then? Yeah, okay. yeah, like everybody throwing right. a guitar when you're like 10 and, you know, the piano thing didn't work out when I was right. like, you know, three or whatever the hell that was, you know. Biggest inspiration? Well, probably, you know, musically, it was John Denver, Beatles, Bob Dylan, uh, that kind of songwriting with the Americana yeah. really resonated first. But um, I was always a rock, like when I was young, 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 and then got into like Rush was and still nice. is was... You know, the one thing about Rush is like they're they are so cinematic. Mm. And if you think about their music, it without is a film time. score. Yeah. It is films. It is yeah. score. It is score and and, and it, it was like, you know, yeah. so, you know, them and Pink Floyd mm -hmm. super like, I mean, that music is as good as any film score I've ever heard. But that's when they used to have a thing called a concept album. Right. So the concept album was meant to you sit down, you put your headphones on, or you put it on your hi-fi stereo system. Yeah. And you listen to the whole damn thing from beginning to end. Yeah. It's a concept. It's an experience. Yeah. That doesn't totally. exist anymore. Not, I not miss like, that. Not like that. I mean, there are some great like I, I like bands, like like yeah. Mastodon. I love. You oh know, yeah, Mastodon, great band. Great, great yep. albums, conceptual. Yep. Um, I you know I love metal. I mean, I love I love every Everything. kind of music. Uh, you know, there's not really one thing that, you know, living in South America, I got exposed to things on, on in, in a Latin way, uh, musically speaking, yes. and that influenced me in some way, you know. But uh, as far as like when I was younger, though, that type of stuff really kind of was like, I couldn't stop listening. You know, I was that kid with right. the jean jacket, yep. the Black Sabbath and the freaking, you know, Zeppelin T-shirts and the boom box. And everything was music, man. I couldn't. St I still can't stop listening to music. I know. It's crazy. I still love music. What's in your playlist nowadays? It's fucking everything. everything. <laughs> now I'm just add. I, I add, can't keep I adding, add. right? It doesn't matter. I just if, you know everything from every from hip hop to EDM yeah. to jazz to you know to indie this or I, yeah. I mean I just. But that being said, there's so few things that just really um, stick with me like glue. Mm. Like there's very few albums that I'll go back to and just listen over and over and over and over again. Like I kind of like some of the classic stuff, right? You know, like uh, I can't even think what I just put in my. I'd have to look, but it's yeah. like you know I listen to it once or twice and it's cool. And, I, and then you move on. But it's there's great. very few fix. things that I just become addicted to that just blow my fucking mind. Mm. So yeah, yeah. I w you know wish oh. it happened more. <laughs> I agree. I agree, man. Sometimes when I want inspiration, I go way back. Like I'll go back to composers like uh, Nikolai Paganini, the violinist uh -huh. the composer. It's when you hear that kind of prowess, mm -hmm. sometimes um, so it might be uh, performed by somebody like Itzhak Perlman, you right? Know, the famed violinist. Yeah, I you know? love it. So, so or, or you, Vladimir Horowitz, the piano player, so you right. hear some play some Chopin. You're like, oh my gosh. 
this is decades ago, and music was so amazing decades. back then. You know, yeah. you know, turns of centuries have centuries, passed. Centuries, yeah, you know? yeah, it's crazy. And you think, wow, you know, it's interesting. So I agree with you. Well, we find that in inspiration in certain little nuggets. Yeah. It's, it's for me, fun. for me now, when I listen to music, I'm listening to production. I'm listening to yeah. what they do, the new sounds, the things that the way reverbs are used. The technology is so amazing, so advanced, isn't it? It, it, it? Well, it's like it's like science fiction. Yes, it's like when yes. I'm sitting at my on my system, it's like I'm you know driving the spaceship like i'm yeah. riding the like the star trip enterprise man it's like it's yes. a trip and the shit that we're able to do is so otherworldly yes um you know and and i still get off right and you know music it's, it's the perfect segue because i know you weren't necessarily a tour guy no. but on my on my template here i have my little questions yeah, yeah. And tour essentials but this is good because studio essentials yeah um speaking of all this modern technology uh, when you think of companies like Output, uh -huh. you know, um, or or these these now these collective uh, uh, software plugin companies mm -hmm. like um, what is it Splice and you know the Audio Plugin Alliance and all these companies, oh, right, right, right. and they have all these amazing plugins. Yeah. So what are your studio essentials, whether it be you know uh, computer based or, or hardware based? What do you right. need to to get your little thing happening in right. your creative space? Uh, studio essentials. You ready? This yeah. is huge. <laughs> You're, okay. Laptop. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ears, ass, and eyes. A great set of monitors. That's great. A great monitor to look at Ooh. and a great seat to sit on. Yeah. Everything else is bullshit. Now, unless you, ha I, I got the very desk, the, the, the desk that you can put up and but down. But that, that's and stand a part up. of it, I man. Love it. Yeah. And your space, man. Yeah. Like your space Thank is you. dope. <laughs> it's so, it's just quirky and cool and funky. It's, yeah. Thank it's you. really good. I'm not blowing smoke. No, no, man. It's, I appreciate it's really, it. You're an East Coaster. You can't blow smoke. It, no, it, it's great. And so, to me. It, all the technology doesn't mean shit if you can't write a beautiful melody and just put three or four chords together that are pretty. There you go. So, I, you know, um, I love instruments. I like tactile. I right. like my, my guitars. You know, yes, sure, I'm a Logic guy. Okay. I got, you know, the, the myriad of, of plugins. I need another compressor, like a hole in my head. Right. You know, if somebody <laughs> wants to sell me another EQ, I'm going to smack them in the head. <laughs> You know, but our inboxes are flooded with that you shit. Know, and yeah, yeah. sometimes, you know, I, I I just bought a bunch of different libraries um, yeah. because uh, you know something was on sale and sure. and and you know yeah it's cool a different sound here. I also when I'm starting a queue, sometimes I'm overwhelmed. I don't know where even to begin. Isn't that the truth? You Let's know? talk about that for a minute. So when you find yourself to sit down or stand up and mm -hmm. and, and you're beginning the process with a blank slate, and you do feel overwhelmed. What is your process there? What do you do? Uh, well, I, I try and push through it. I try and listen to other music okay. that might inspire me. If you know, usually in you know TV or film or uh, commercial, there's usually some sort of temp or something that if I'm writing for a specific project and they want something, they have so something. Reference. That, yeah, yeah, and that helps a lot. It helps on a tempo level, an energy level. Um, you know, and so I, I start there usually and, okay. um, you know, I usually also am the guy that I'll usually start on, um, with my drums and percussion and map th things out and then I'll take the guitar and if I have to do something that's actually has some chordal structure to it, I'll work it out on the guitar or the piano. Nice. But, um. You know, usually I st I'm starting my stuff. Rhythm is really important to me. The the movement of it, and Agreed. and then and then I work around that. That's like the skeleton for me. That's beautiful. So so you never really start from a melodic structure first. It's always rhythmic based. Sometimes I might have stuff on my phone, my iPhone. Yeah. You know, I'm like one of those guys. Like everybody, it's yeah. like it's an amazing tool. And so I'll be like, let me listen to that and see if there's a melody or something that I could reuse that I already wrote you know right, right. but overall you know I, I just try and uh, if I feel like I'm getting stuck I just you know sometimes just walk away right go watch a movie go watch a movie go ride your go, like go I'll go ride my bike yeah, yeah. Um, you know and and, and not put that pressure on me I like starting a, a project um, the day after I get it and because I like to sleep on it and then I dream about it, and I think about it, Smart. and then I have all, and then I wake up in the morning super jazzed, You're ready. and I'm like, oh shit, I got to do this, this, and this. Yeah. If I have that time, yeah. sometimes I have to start stuff right away. But yeah, sure. Just
I will be the first to admit it's easy to get overwhelmed as a composer, producer, songwriter, artist, instrumentalist. There's so many variables that go into what we do on a daily basis. Once again, balance is key. Don't be afraid to take multiple breaks and refresh your ears. Subscribe to the Career Musician Podcast on iTunes. I was able to really get some some chops and be start to become a professional. I had a, a kind of mentor composer, who, the guy that showed me Logic in like 90, it was called E-Magic back then. I remember. It was like 96, 97. Wow. So I was, you know, I was doing commercial work. I was soliciting outside of this production, this television network. Um, and, you know, I was doing some Mexican supermarket commercials, casino commercials. Cool. And I was like, yeah, I need to take it to the next level. I recorded an album as a songwriter. I did it at the Village Recorder. And I came to L.A. I hired high, the like Bob Glob on bass and uh, Nick Finson on drums. Great studio dudes. And my yeah. mentor actually took me to L.A. before that for a session at Capitol Studios. He was doing com- – back in the day when he was doing TV commercials, my mentor, um, a guy named Cliff Sardi, all the commercials were done like – he did – he'd do a live band. He'd get like yeah, L.A.'s best studio yeah, musicians beautiful. for commercials in Arizona, like for the lottery. And he took me along and that was inspiring. And then he produced my album. He's a wonderful guy. Beautiful. And – um he he just he was he was very unselfish and very giving and you know, teaching me and just his just everything and that's how I want to be like I think I want to empower people to be successful I don't I, there's no trade secrets mm. if people want to work with me they want to work with me because they want to work with me there you go you know I mean if they don't want to work with me they don't want to work with me but I, there's no trade secrets it's a it's really a, a game of people liking you feeling like you can show up feel like you communicate effectively you're not an artist brooding in your corner you know you got to be a you got to be articulate you got to be responsible mm-hmm. you know uh, and you got to create effectively quickly um, but uh, I did that album at the village and I was like oh, man LA dude I was like, it was like magic hour. I'm Santa Monica in world class village recorder recording some songs I did. I listen back to them now. They were horrible. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) what was anybody thinking? Um, And I was like, I got to move to LA. You were infatuated. It was like, this place was everything I always wanted to come to because I love that Laurel Canyon, uh, you know, California country, the Mm -hmm. Eagles. It, It was everything. And I was like, screw it. So in 2000, then I left and I came here. Wow. I just said, you know. That's so. that's an incredible trajectory, it, man. It was, I love it. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of nuts. Everybody thought I'm nuts. But I, but, and that's what happens, again, yeah. with the nomadic, nutty creatures that we are. Yeah. But you said something, uh, two things. So Magic Hour, you know, that's yeah. really cool. A buddy yeah. of mine is working on a film. He's calling it Magic yeah, Hour. Yeah, I've or called or the track Magic Hour. There's something yeah. special yeah, about that. It's, it's, it's only in how California. Else you, how else do you describe it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. Um, but the other thing you, you started touching on were some of the attributes of a, of a really good sound career musician. Mm-hmm. So again, obviously the title of this podcast, The Career Musician, the hashtag that I use, hopefully it'll catch on. I see a couple people using it as well. Um, the whole premise of this podcast mm-hmm. is sharing the knowledge. Because mm-hmm. if you want to work with me, you're going to work with me. It's, I don't need. There's no re- reason for me to guard my little... Uh, uh, chestnuts that I gathered like a squirrel. Right. No, because everybody there's enough chestnuts to go around. Right. We're all going to eat. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in that. And again, you alluded to that. Mm-hmm. Some of the attributes, you know, being on time, not being a sulky artist, not being yeah. temperamental, easy to get along with, being able to take direction. So talk some yeah. more about that. A professional career musician, whether you're a session cat or a composer or a producer, or you know, talk about anything that. like yeah. And, and let me preface by saying. I don't know. If I, I've not mastered this. Of course. You know? I don't think any. I'm still work in progress. <laughs> I learn a lot. I have yes. business partners that are really wonderful, smart people, uh, right. successful people. I learn from them. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, maybe they learn a little from me. We all got our thing. I could be uh, I could be a curmudgeon you know, East Coast, uh, you know, uh, dude. I'm, I'm not saying I'm a yes guy all the time. You know, I, I've struggled to try and find my voice, work on my ego. Um, you know, we, we, I do this for a living. I'm fortunate enough like you, this is how we make our living. So it is frustrating when we're constantly asked to compromise, 
are um, dollars and cents when there's no money, when people want things for free. Yep. It's a struggle. You have to sort of um, navigate what is a smart business decision to say yes to and no, and to say no to. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I, I make a smart decision. Sometimes I don't, you know. Yeah, I mean, you were just consulting um, me over lunch about some things. Right. With this very right. regard. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I feel like um, something I said to you is, um, you know, you could treat your music and your art like your wife or you can treat it like a hooker. <laughs> you know, it's a slight vulgar I description. You could oh. treat it like a hoe yeah. and you can pimp it out oh. to as many people. Ooh. You could retitle your music and get it out there on non-exclusive deals and just mm. do crappy, shitty things to it just for a buck. Mm. Or you can treat your music with love and respect and feel like it deserves to be um, put in, in the light of that, that it, you know, where, where it's, it's, it's respected. And, um, you know, that to me is really important. And, and that's how I operate. Um, I try to treat, I treat my music like, you know, it's my wife. That's right. And um, I feel we should get paid on our music. I feel like publishers should get paid for their for for licensing mm -hmm. i feel like um retitling is not a healthy thing for the industry i also feel like if you if you're if, if your goal is money 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 hey that's your thing but that's not my thing you do shit for the money it, uh it's just gonna come and bite you in the ass at the end of the day that's never a good motive you know i do work. things based on my feel for my love, for the project, the people possibly involved. I'll right. do something for free if the people involved in the project's really good. I'd love to do it. It's right. it's about that collaborative effort, that give and take. Um, so I, I just think that that's something that I kind of like decide, hey, is this, uh, you know, I'm still, I still feel like I'm in the beginning of my middle of my career, yeah. but I, I, I guess I am privileged enough to sometimes say no and feel like, look, if they're not going to pay me enough or they're not going to, you know, treat this gig the way I feel it should be treated I'm just not interested in doing it That's it. these are the parameters of when to say no that's one when of the to questions say no. yeah. yeah and yeah. and and really that does that that really helps um as somebody young coming up in the industry I think this kind of information is really valuable they need to hear this and and it's okay they're the to ones that no. are going to change it yes so they're, so expound yeah there I mean look if you're a young composer or an artist or a songwriter or a rock star EDM a producer whatever it's like look you know you want to get your music on TV you want to get it in a film on an Apple commercial on a uh, you know you want to but you gotta like take you know just sometimes you know if it's not right you know if you're compromising your values you know I just urge that younger generation to take the pride in their art and not, you know, just give it away uh, and, and, you know, attempt to say, no, uh, you need to pay me if I'm going to write music for your film. And if you're going to write music for free for a feature or for a project that is um, in that sort of style, like for, let's take a feature film, then you own the rights to it. Mm. Then make sure you educate yourself on licensing, publishing, PROs, ASCAP, CSAC, and BMI. Super important. You gotta have an understanding for these concepts, or you're you're gonna you know you're gonna get screwed. Well, this okay. This is the the meat and potatoes of your particular interview. I, I feel like you excel in lots of things, but this is one particular area where you know perhaps you really grab the bull by the horns. Break that down, okay? So I, I feel like I have a decent understanding of how publishing works and the difference right. between <laughs> publishing royalties and writer's royalties. Let's just start there. Mm -hmm. Let's not even get into all the other concepts. Right. Break that down because it was broken down to me many years ago in a, in a great way with the whole pie. And yeah. So explain that to uh, everyone. Essentially, when you write music, there you're... you're Hopefully, eventually, you join a PRO. What is a PRO? Um, Performing Rights Organization. Right. right. Okay. So what there, does that mean? there, there, there are three of them in the United States. Yeah. Each country has their own set of laws. There are different organizations that govern the intellectual property of songs and music. In the United States, there's ASCAP, CSAC, and BMI. BMI. And we're talking about IP, intellectual and, property. Well, yeah, IP is, you know, you write a song, you uh, draw a picture, take a, photo a photograph, write a script. 
you know, it's uh, intellectual property. Right. And so, you know, you register your songs. You could also register them with the uh, registry of copyright um, in, in Washington. But, you you know, there are two sides to a, a piece of music. There's the writer's portion. And you just look at it as a coin. One side is your writer's share. Your other side is your publishing share. Mm-hmm. It's unfortunately, since it's not like something you can grab and tangible like a cup, it's you just got to picture this in your head. Your piece of music has two sides to it. If and the way I explain it and, you know, I'm not an attorney and uh, and so I have possibly a crude way of articulating it. But if you own your publishing, if you own your your publishing side, then you're basically steering your car in the direction you want it to go. You want it to go left, you ha- you can control that. You want it to go right, you can control that. Um, if you don't own your publishing, that means in some form or fashion, you might have done a work for hire agreement where you got paid maybe a certain amount of money. Sometimes people don't pay you any money <laughs> um, and you give up your ownership, your copyright to that piece of music which would be considered the publishing share. Usually you retain 100% of your writer share. And you should always try and retain 100% of your writer share. There are some instances where maybe if you're ghosting for a composer on a show, you might split the writers 50-50. That to me is legit. Um, you know, But uh, if, somebody, if you write a piece of music for a production music catalog and they want to take 50% of your writer share, that's not legit. There, you know, there's all these different kinds well, of and, deals. And so. let's talk about why yeah. that's not legit, because I've had, I have quite the extensive or experience. Or I should say that's stuff. scummy. Or it's, yeah, here you go. Hey, keep it <laughs> East Coast. Yeah. Keep it fucking real. Yeah. No, seriously, and I do believe that people skew the truth sometimes. Look, as Jay just said, you have 50% for the publishing side, 50% for the writer's side. You put those together, equals 100%. Or as BMI does it, it's two hundred percent. Right, right. They, they, I was going to say, yeah, that, right. they, they do one hundred percent writers. Yeah, but it's all the same thing. Now how you slice it right. up? But now when you have a company that says, "Look, we're going to take fifty percent of your writer share," that's not cool because now they're infringing upon your particular IP, your property. Well, to me, that's also just greedy. Yes, and I think that's. Um, I, I just feel I, I, again, you know, there are some instances where there you can split the writer share. Uh, that I, I don't feel it's greedy, especially if you're getting an upfront fee and you're getting on the Q sheet. Yes. And, but there, are, but, but I just feel like different industries sort of, uh, there's different ethics in my opinion and how things should go for how you write advertising music, film music, television music, production music, right. media music. Right. Like, you know, um, stuff that might not be on broadcast TV, it might be on YouTube or, or yeah, Vimeo, streaming, streaming or uh, podcast stuff. So, I, you know, and that's just me. I have a, a perspective of how I feel it should be on a fairness level and what is a, a, a good deal and what is a bad deal. And I feel there's just a lot of companies out there that are not paying for music, taking a larger piece of the pie, not necessarily delivering or over-promising. You know, uh, if people work for my company or work for me as a composer or a catalog, I, in a way, underpromise. I don't want to oversell because to me, I think oversell, overselling is bullshit. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's no guarantee uh, when things get used or licensed. You know, when it's needed, it's needed. There's no magic button. I, I wish. Uh, you know, the amount of diversity that clients are looking for musically. And let me tell you the descriptions of how they describe music. Mm. Each client has, well, we're looking for Latin that's airy um, and minimalistic, but electronic, uh, contemporary, but 80s style. And you're like, what? The? And then you got to decipher that shit. You got to you know? decipher. So I, I'm jumping around. But no, I love it. I love it. You know, I, I, I feel like it's just always get somebody in your corner that's an attorney or somebody that knows contracts that helps you spend the money to have stuff looked at ask people for help but you just said a magic uh, phrase spend the money because a lot of people say well i don't have any money to hire an attorney okay well you know what you do have to do your due diligence do some research try to find some people you can talk to go to mixers network okay eventually you'll rub elbows with these types of people so let's right? let's talk about that you got yeah. you got bmi yeah ascap csac thank you a, a, a good resource for production music there's the production music association the pma yeah Okay, they do a conference every year in Los Angeles. In the fall. That, that's in the fall, production music conference. I don't know the specific dates. Yep. It's somewhere online. Mm-hmm. You have, um, you know, all these different organizations. Let's be real. Sometimes as creative beings, we're real introverted. 
We don't want to go out and network and meet people. We want to stay in our studio and create. We want to write the next hit song, work on some compositions for a hopeful TV show or a placement. But look, at the end of the day, if you're not networking, chances are you're not working. Yes, you can make money, but it takes time and it takes a lot of hard work. And you're not going to be a millionaire overnight. Well, the thing is, it's like, look, musicians are you inherently mean? needy people to get their music out there. Yeah. And we become desperate. Yes. And, you know, the record industry has collapsed as far as who's really making a gazillion dollars selling albums because the physical medium is gone. It's all streaming. Spotify and the streamings pay shit mm. on royalties. Mm. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon pay shit on streaming royalties for underscore for TV shows for the composer. Still broadcast royalties are great and can do well. But at the end of the day... But let's do, yeah. so explain. So streaming royalties and broadcast royalties. Well, for those who may not understand the difference. Okay, streaming is Netflix. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, online, streaming, uh, online right. streaming, watching movies, TV shows, you might get a little bit, but not. Right. it's not like if it's on ABC, CBS, MTV, right. cable channels, those so, royalties are far better. And that's broadcast. And that's broadcast. Now, when you break broadcast down, though, uh -huh. there's cable and yeah. there's, there's a network. network. Right. I mean, and then, and then, you know, if your music airs at eight in the morning, it's a different fee than at eight at night. If the, right. if the ratings are higher for a show at 8 o'clock on ABC and the ratings are not as high on CBS, you're going to make more money on ABC. I mean, yes. each network has its own deals with the PROs. So variables. There's a lot of variables. The amount of time. Yes. Is it underscore? Is it a theme? Does it have vocals on it? it does. I mean, all these things are another penny here, another five cents there. I, well, I always say it's the penny stocks. I'm glad you brought yeah. that up because another five cents here. Another, literally, if, if you scroll through, when I scroll through my statements, and I'm sure there's millions of people like me, when we scroll through our statements, you literally see item by item by item, $2.36 here, 15 cents yeah. there, 29 cents here. Oh, this queue was on for... It was it, it was on for seven seconds yeah. and it got twelve dollars. Yeah. All right. right, you know, they add up. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, I tell musicians you can produce income from this. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, it's a marathon, not a race. That's right. So you know, you got to be in the shit for the long haul. The amount of music you have out there and getting it to legitimate, authentic places that represent it. Not these uh, online, you know, royalty-free sites mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the, you know, because it's trash for cash. It's cheap shit. That's right. And again, you're treating your music like your wife. Right, or you treat you it like want. a hooker. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, but it, 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 it's hard because it's not instant gratification. It takes time to build up a library of music. Your music's got to sound like it came off a record. That's right. You know, if you're not a producer and an engineer and know how to mix your shit great, it's not going to get used. You can't just be a great musician nowadays. You have to be a, a full, well-rounded, you know, uh, producer, musician, right. distributor, artist, right. you know, graphic artist. You got to do mm. it all yourself. You know, you're yeah, always doing it all yourself. Everything yeah. that you're doing, I mean, you're all, you know, everything. I called you the other day, you're on a photo shoot. Right. You know, it, it's just nonstop. So right. if you're getting started in this, it's finding companies that really treat you well and respect what you do, hopefully pay you for your music, do fair deals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, uh, you can't expect to, to get it to them and then call them in a month and be like, where's my royalties? Mm -hmm. It takes a year, it takes two years, it takes three years for things to get into the system, get out, get into the shows, have music supervisors or editors pick your music, get on the cue sheet. Once it gets on the cue sheet, it's another eight months until it comes into the raw, you know, into your pocket. Break that down. What does that mean when you say get it on a cue sheet? So when you're on TV shows or films, you know, every time, every scene, every time a piece of music is used, it's written down. The tedious job, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of it's automatically spit right, out from right. your avid, the avids, and it's like the avids know, are the editing, the editing stuff. Where the guys edit, the so edit. you know, it's like you know, it, two seconds that track aired from two seconds to twenty seconds of this time frame. This is the name of the composer, the publishing company, right. underscore Q, uh, all the pertinent information that is needed, and it's in se sequential order as the running time of the show. And then that is submitted to the PROs, and then they digest that. 
and, and that's how they create their statements. They're, 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 pay, they they right? see what to pay you. Right. Uh, but, you know, ASCAP does uh, payments based on certain um, analytics and or BMI, you know, it based things on ratings. Mm-hmm. And every PRO does things a little bit differently. Is, uh, is it a survey? I'm looking for the right word. Mm. I think ASCAP does some stuff based on a survey. Even, even to me, some of this shit is like... Um, it, it's like what it's, it's, deep, it's it, intense, it, yeah. it, it, it is and you know I, I, I'm fair I think I know somewhat I'm talking about and sometimes it's just it's dumbfounding yeah you know yeah. And, and you can't get straight answers from from the PROs they're yeah. not particularly transparent there um, are resources but it's yeah you have to do your you know and you got to have relationships with them I mean mm-hmm. m- me and my business partners yet we have relationships with the people that work in BMI if there's issues we can call them but sometimes it's hard to get these people on the phone and get a straight answer so yeah. but again it's a matter it's a marathon it is. and 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 know that you know i, I kind of feel like the theory of like last man standing man if you could push through the shit and the hard times and mm-hmm. you really got talent and you got drive and you got passion and you're you know you're pleasant to be around like if you're on tour if you're miserable right. to be around you're off that tour right that's right um you're, you're gonna you're gonna last and you're gonna have a career Man, I feel yeah. like you're speaking to me directly. <laughs> yeah. so like, cause I, as we went to lunch today, I'm sitting here crying to Jay. I'm saying, Jay, I don't know. Am I doing the right thing? Is this right? Did I make this right move? Am I, am I, am I thinking about this in the right manner? And we all need that. Yeah, meanwhile, Michael's toured the world with one of the biggest uh, R&B uh, artists in the history of the world. So, okay, whatever. But, but you understand. Yeah. It, it's, 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 and look, we're in the town of you're only as big as your last achievement. And, and, and you know, yeah. you know, that that is yeah. that is uh, somehow you were reminded of that. <laughs> I don't know. Ah, the wild, wild west. Of course, it could be stressful dealing with all the emotions that come along with this business. Rejection and just the scrappling to try to make ends meet sometimes. But listen, hang in there, because remember, it's not a destination. It's a journey. And we must fight on a daily basis to make it to the next frontier of our career. You, you said the magic word. It, it all boils down to relationships. Look, you yeah. and I wouldn't be here hanging if we didn't have a relationship. How did that relationship culti- get cultivated? Well, we met at this little music club thing. Yeah. A mutual friend both invited us. Brett Boyette. Love you, Brett. Yeah, hey, he's, Brett. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he's a talented songwriter. Yeah, yeah he's, he's blowing up. Producer, composer, songwriter. Absolutely. Totally blowing up. He's doing great. He invited us both. We go to this hang. You and I talk. Kindred spirits, you know. Yeah. So a relationship yeah. has been cultivated. Yeah. Perhaps we're going to do some business together with music. I, I hope so. I, I think so, yeah. right? So, but again, that didn't happen overnight. Number two, perseverance. You just said it. It's the marathon. Yeah, but you right? got to be. You got to be. You know, gently pushy, nicely, nicely. Gently pushy. Uh, you got. You know. You got to. Nicely uh, persistent. Yeah. How do you, you know? And and I mean, yeah. you know, to this day, I'm emailing, I'm calling, you know, I'm I contact showrunners and executive producers, and right. you know, you're reaching out. Hey, we don't need anything right now. We're cool. We got we got catalogs. We got composer. We got a music supervisor. Okay, cool. I'll I'll put them on my calendar to reach out with them in another month to two months. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's still to this day at my age, everything that I've been through, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, I'm still hustling like I always have hustled i love know? that i love that so Man. you know it's 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 still it's still it's still a hustle so i want to hear that process for you because again you have achieved many great things in your career you put it on your calendar to call certain people yeah so you call you know that. well you know there's 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 different fantastic uh file makers and hub spots and all these different online right. programs that help you organize and i mean you know your freaking iphone you can put your reminders and you're keeping track of who you call what was the conversation like i mean i'm sure we all do that to a degree I'm a google uh doc google doc. docs we google yeah, docs yeah, up yeah. the butt yeah, yeah, you know yeah, they're yeah. great yeah, so it's, awesome, yeah. uh, it, it's you know and sometimes you're like you're looking at that person you're like oh do i email them oh, i don't want to be a pain in the ass well, well, fuck it just hit send just be like hey you know i'm touching base you need anything what can i do for you uh or, you know everybody tries to philosophically say how is the best way to do and strategize your email with even the subject line right you know you could type in specific subject lines into uh, an email uh, a website that tells you if that subject line is a good subject line <laughs> is that a trip yeah so you could be like yeah. hey what's up 
And they'll be like, yeah, sucky subject line, that 10% good, <laughs> yeah. you know, or if you say, you know, uh, uh, more specific. Yeah, I always find, so right? it, yeah. it's always a challenge, yeah. man. And Hustle, persevere, figure it out, be clever, be witty, schmooze, send the damn email, just hit send for crying out loud. I know it's a lot to juggle, it's a lot to figure out. But Jason's right. Sometimes you just got to put it out there and let it be. Let your music and your work speak for itself. Now, some other components of, of the licensing game. Uh, when we say licensing, it's really borrowed from a term uh, like synchronization, uh, sync license or, or sync fee. So break that aspect of it down when you have the sync, the license fee, the sync Organization mm -hmm. fee versus work made for hire. Expound on that a little bit okay. from your experience. So I own a music catalog. I own a company. It's called Bulletproof. I'm partners in a company called Bulletproof Bear. We represent the, oh, about uh, over 40,000 pieces of music, artists, songs, underscore, uh, classical music. I mean, every style of music. My catalog that I created and own and wrote a lot and I have other artists in there other composers it's sure. called Supersonic Noise I was going to ask you because you have two you, companies yeah. well Supersonic Noise is an imprint in Bulletproof Bear so Bulletproof Bear is the uh, tree okay. and the branches of the tree are the other little individual catalogs that we represent Great. we represent them around the world we have partners in other countries that um, are, are international sub-publishers and you know we do blanket license deals where, they, where a network or a TV show is going to use our whole catalog, whatever they want, for a fee. Mm -hmm. They might pay either for a year, they might pay per episode, they might pay for a series of shows, like uh, just 12 episodes of one show. Um, and then we do individual licensing needle drop, where it's one needle drop, think the dropping the needle problem. on a record. Yeah. Um, you know, so where the needle drop is a one-off is 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 a one-time one licensing fee. Right. Oh, hey, I have a commercial and uh, I'm looking for a hip hop track. Okay, here, what do you kind of hip hop style tempo vibe? Here's 20 hip hop tracks. See if anything works for you. Oh, none of these work for me. Here, I'll send you another 20 or 30 hip hop tracks, right. and they pick one. Oh, we love that track. Okay, that's what is that for? Is it a national commercial, a regional right. commercial? How many seconds? Blah blah blah. And then we base the fee off that and it's a license they pay us and they're renting the music for the term of their product that agreement of that agreement if you if you're sharing a sync fee mm -hmm. with a composer or a songwriter then that's one type of deal however if you're doing a work made for hire right that's a different type of deal exactly so, so some some deals uh and we have them in the catalog is um i'm going to pay you x amount of money you're going to write music for me, and I'm going to own the music. That's it. You right. retain your writer share. So you work made for hire. Work, work for, made for hire, work for hire. You'll retain your writer share. You'll always get that royalty. So you write some, some rock tracks for me. I get it on a reality show, and I make, I'm make. i the publisher. You're the writer. It made uh, $200 on uh, it made a hundred dollars on the writer side it made a hundred dollars on the publishing side they mirror each other right absolutely and then i try and get a license in another show and another show or maybe a commercial and hopefully you get that out and you always make your money if it's a sync split deal then if i made five hundred dollars on that track i'm giving you 250 right so then you're splitting That's, that sync fee that sync fee and a sync fee is is that license fee right so if, I, if that company pays you that licensing fee. And my deal with you is that kind of deal. Well, if I get a $10,000 TV commercial, you know, then I'm going to give you, and, and my deal is a 50-50 split, mm -hmm. I get five grand and you get five grand. Now, with your companies, you uh -huh. do both types of deals? Yeah, with Supersonic, I usually do a work for hire. I pay people to write for me, mm -hmm. and, and that's how I do it. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the other catalogs under Bulletproof Bear do various deals I depending see. on how they're comfortable doing them. So again, you have to be well-versed. Yeah, and a, and a wide array of, of deals yeah. and how they work. But let, let me say this, so which we talked about earlier, if if I give you money uh, for to, or as a work for hire, you're getting paid right away. Right. If I'm going to do a, a if I'm going to split the sync fees with you, um, and I don't pay you any upfront money, mm -hmm. you give me that f track, but uh, as a gratis for the up, there's no upfront, but the deal on the back end is a sync split mm -hmm. or, um, or we're going to split the license fee. What if I don't get that track licensed? 
What if it's a, a reggae track and I'm not asked for reggae for three or four years? So nobody's seeing any income then. Right. I'm not seeing any income and you're not. You're not. At least on the right. work for hire, I get to pay the artist up front something that's pretty decent for their time. They'll retain their writer share. Um, and, you know, you could have a little money in your pocket. There is no guarantee that this stuff is going to get licensed. The requests are all over the place. The requests are crazy weird. Right. They're, they're so they're, – it's never as simple as I just need some hip-hop. <laughs> or I just need some rock or I just need some tension music there are always so many different you know what the client wants right right uh, yeah. it's like it's like you know I want light and airy not you know minimalistic with no drums but maybe a TikTok and you know and it's like you have it, it, there's just no way of ever knowing what, what you know or let's say um, you know guesstimating what exactly they're going to want because they're always going to come up with something that you never expected you know, when I get a simple, hey, I just need some, you know, um, one of my clients, uh, Fox Sports, you know, they'll give me a, a request, uh, hip hop, you know, rock, orchestral, you know, and that's great because I'll simple. just, I'll make playlists for them that are really super, you know, yeah. you know right on Raw. the money, but it's for sports. So, you know, it's got to have some energy to it, right? Blasting the stereotype of musicians. Follow us at the Career Musician Podcast. Get educated, people. Do your due diligence. Just do it. You got this. Trust. Believe. Focus. And don't buy into the hype. Just stay on your trajectory. Make it happen. You can do it, baby. You can do it. Work made for hire. Oh, I'm signing away my rights to the song. I'm giving, no. No you still retain your writer's portion. Yeah. So you still are going to get writer's royalties from your PRO. You're, again, you're not you're not steering the car. That's the only difference. Right. You're still going to retain royalties from that, but you are it, it's a we, I do exclusive deals, so that means that your music's only with me. That uh, particular cue is only with Yeah, you. I don't do retitling. And I feel like I right. have to iterate that right. because a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. What do you mean? Everything I write, you own? No. It's only for the songs or yeah. cues that are on that schedule. A in that particular contract. Totally, totally. So I, I feel like I have to make that 100% yeah. clear. You clear, know? totally. Yeah. And then, so if, 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 if Josh mm -hmm. writes 10 cues for you, mm -hmm. there's a work made for hire, you pay him his upfront production fee, right? okay? He also retains 100% mm -hmm. of his writer's royalties. Yeah. So I want to make sure that the but I, I understands I, it. Yeah, and I own the music and I control the music. Meaning, it doesn't mean <laughs> right. that you own this artist. I, 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 I don't, I never take his writer's portion correct i i because the writers is inherently theirs to get for the rest of their lives josh would no longer control that music he would still always garner the money from it yes. if I, but I, it's my job to get it licensed so if you take used. it to fox sports if you take it to american idol if right. you take it to cbs wherever you take right. it right right and I have those relationships. Josh does. Right. Josh is. There you go. You know, and that's the thing. I've cultivated relationships, other companies. It's like, look, we, are, we all are not doing everything. You know, I mean, you're a composer, you're a writer, you're an artist. That doesn't mean that you have all those not, you know, those those relationships. I mean, you might have some, right. but these companies are cultivate these relationships over tens and twenties of years and whatever. And then that's what they do. They go out there and they get the stuff placed. Absolutely. One of the biggest challenges is understanding how all of this works. The splitting of the royalties of the publishing side, the writer's side. Like Jason mentioned, go ahead and do some research. The PROs are there for us. And wrapping things up, uh, I, have, I do have two questions. A memorable moment for you in your career that you said, wow, you know what? Number one, I'm grateful. Number two, I couldn't do anything else. This is why I'm doing this. Uh, I Before I, I definitely, I mean, this one, I wrote the uh, theme for a, 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 a advanced auto parts. Oh. Okay. It was, uh, I was freelance composer in LA. Uh, when I moved here, I was uh I, I did. A, I was. I, I ended up working a lot with this one company. They were called Machine Head. They were out of Venice, and uh, I was one of their composers, like a staff composer, doing gazillions of freaking commercials a, 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 a week. But before I was with them on a, on a full time level, um, I was doing freelance with them, 
And uh, I got a pitch to write the theme for, you know, amongst 20 other probably people. Sure. And I wrote the Advanced Auto Parts theme. It was a broadcast TV commercial radio spot. Um, and I did so well on that commercial. It was sort of mind freaking blowing. And, um, you know, let's just say I ended up, you know, buying a condo in West Hollywood with the help of what I made. It it really, and I was young and it really just was, um, an incredible experience to, to finally make the kind of money that you're just sitting there saying, what do you mean? I could buy any fucking guitar I want to buy, like, <laughs> like, you know. And I did. I went out and bought. A, I, was just, I, okay. I, I, I bought a freaking badass guitar. Then that's three final questions. We got to <laughs> yeah, add yeah. that in. All right. So it, that was so a magical a moment. moment. Yeah, it was really special. I, I re- love that. I was really thankful to get that opportunity, and then that yeah. started a really wonderful relationship with Machine Head. Um, so, so so explain. I'm, I'm diving off again. Okay. See, you're you're an onion with many layers. <laughs> so so the difference. That's not what my wife says. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the difference between a staff composer, staff writer, mm-hmm. or a freelance. Mm-hmm. How did your your staff deal work? I always wondered. I used mm-hmm. to work with an agency called Barton Holt. Mm-hmm. They did a lot of commercials and jazz, and they would always hire me as a session guitar player. Right. I would come in. A good buddy of mine was the staff composer. Uh, it was inappropriate to ask him, hey, what's your deal? How do you get yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm asking you, know, I'm curious, how does yeah. a staff writer deal work? Well, mine was unique in the sense of, is I, we called it permalance. So I, they gave me a studio. I would go to Venice every day. I worked out of their studio. It was beautiful. I had some talented co-workers that I still have relationships with to this day. I wrote on, I, I was pushed creatively. I was pushed emotionally, mentally. It was, you know, it, it was an incredible, fantastic experience. I would never trade it mm. for anything. Mm. But uh, my deal particularly was uh, they gave me a room and I basically worked on everything and pitched along with the other, uh, you know, quote unquote, Permalance guys. How many uh, Permalance people on staff? There was uh, one, two, three, three guys plus me okay um, so four. yeah maybe at one point five and you know there was like a staff engineer yeah. um and then you, you know we so had that person producer. would do your mixes for you um, or how did that no work? i we still did most of our own mixes but okay. they would they would do sometimes they would do our own mixes but if we recorded like sometimes an accordion or a brass section or something like that they would do it then send us the files gotcha. but we still you know each composer still kind of did their own mixing and on and their own stuff like that okay. and um you know, they paid me. Uh, I didn't get a salary. I didn't get health insurance, but I, you know, I got demo fees, and I got when I won a job. You know, I got a little bit better of a percentage of than commission. if you were a freelance outsider gotcha. guy. Um, and you know, you just got opportunity to pitch on everything. Like me and these three guys. The inside track. Well, me and the three guys. You know, we were always we were on the calls with the agencies. We were on the briefs. We were, you know, when you're a freelance guy in advertising, you're very segregated from what's really going on. Mm. You're treated a lot different. You don't know what the truth is mm. as far as how many people are on the job. Say that again, because it's, it's the same in the music it's, industry, it's, bro. It's, it's a very different being freelance oh. for a music house as opposed to being either permalance or staff or yes. in the inner circle and so yes. i was fortunate enough to because you're privy to, well and you're also look when you're doing changes and you understand the brief and you speak to the client you have a better sort of chance of nailing it as opposed to the producer telling you what they want to hear from what mm-hmm. they heard or maybe the producer is like let's get a couple of people to do some out of the box fuck the brief uh, kind of right. stabs at it. So yeah. even though the even though the, the 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 agency wants Uber pop, you know, with hand claps, they're like, let's give them some indie rock, some guys too, just to give them some diversity. Yeah. So you're doing a demo, but your chances of getting it because you you know you're yeah. you're just yeah, it's yeah. some redirect. Sure. But um, so that was kind of how we worked, and okay. um, yeah. But again, relationships are everything. Relationships literally are the the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah, I, mean, I guess so. I mean, with, friend, people want to work with their friends, right? Yeah. So if you got friends that are on a show and they know you're a talented musician and they're like, you know, and you're kind of sexy and you're a rock star and you've been on tour and you've got some stupid credits with fantastic rock stars and you've played with right. Barbara Streisand and Babyface. I don't know who right. the fuck that is. 
and you, you know, you, you just, just call me a sexy rock star. You are kind of I'm sexy. blushing. You are. You're good looking up there. But you know, people want to be close to that. Man, you know, I, I think that that's a special because at the end of the day, if somebody as special as Babyface realizes your talent and has you up there next to him playing his music, which we know at the end of the day, he's a writer and his songs are very uh, intimate and personal and special to him. If he's getting you to play that, then what do you think an ad exec or some executive producer is going to think about you? They're going to obviously be pretty enamored mm -hmm. at that experience. And to me, that is a real amazing opportunity I, I i'm not that guy i was never a tour guy i was God, just I a studio you. dude you know my, my panties just came off for you just so you know <laughs> it's the truth it's <laughs> true look if you sucked i wouldn't even be here but you know it's, so, so, so so words of wisdom this is the perfect segue jay yeah. listen we are fortunate okay and, and sometimes we all feel like we all go through these moments whoa it's me i can't get this i can't get this blah 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 it's not happening for me Words of wisdom, man. Rome wasn't built in a day. There you go. You know, you, uh, go. you just got to push and uh, balance. Balance, balance I is love key. That. You know. A good one. How many hours a day do you find yourself actually working? Uh, well, I don't know. I never really count because it's like I, I might end up working and then I, I love going to lunch because I like to get out. And then I'll come home and I'll like do more email and then I'll be like, I'm going to watch like a half hour or an hour of a TV show. And then I get two emails and then I'm back in the studio doing more right. work or email. You know, but my 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 you know, I'm not on a show right now. If I'm on a show, I'm writing every day. If I'm on a show and I got to write cues and I'm writing every day and I'm trying to write one, two, three, if it's a cue thing, if I'm scoring a picture, you know, if I'm not writing on cues, I'm still working though. I don't feel like I'm working because mm -hmm. it's like, but you know, I'm on calls, I'm messing with, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring in talent. I'm mm -hmm. trying to build the catalog. So you're curating I'm, constantly. I'm, yes. I'm trying to bring in opportunities to Bulletproof Bear, trying to bring yeah. in shows, production companies to use the catalog to possibly compose, you know. You're a freaking juggler. Yeah, That's but I don't, do. I, but yeah, but you know, I, I don't think about it. But it's I mean, innate. Yeah, yeah. This is just yeah. like, you know, I mean, dude, this isn't a job. This isn't yeah. work. <laughs> I'm not digging ditches, bro. I'm Top freaking, wood, yes. I'm loving, are, I get to, you know, so w work, you know, I feel like I just, I do what I love. So it's not work. I, you, you know, when it's work is when, you know, maybe you have a producer or somebody not happy or you can't freaking nail what they're looking for and it's frustrating the shit out of you because yeah. like, they're like, this still isn't working. You're like, what are you talking about? This is the best freaking cue I've ever done in my life. Right. Okay. It's, it's a struggle. I, I, I want to be, I still want to be busier. Right. You know? I, want, I, want, I suffer I, from the I want to be busier itis too. Well, I, I want, I want I, you know, I want 40 shows. I want Bulletproof Bear right. to be on 40, 50, 60 programs. I want to be one of the top 10 music catalogs that treat its composers with respect, right. that take care of the composers, that do solid good deals, and that just has great music. I don't need to right. be the, the, have the largest amount of tracks. I just want some great music. Great artists, that. so you know that's what I'm trying to do. I love that. So, Your guitar collection, how many? Uh, let's see, what do I got? I got uh, not as many as you. <laughs> <laughs> you got, this is just like <laughs> fucking awesome. Um, and I'm a different kind of collector. Okay. You know how we all have our I, we all have our quirks. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but right now I'm running about let's see, five, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, 19, about twenty. Guitars, and then I got a lot of ukuleles. Yes. I got some interesting instruments, you know, right. some quirky yeah. thingamadoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, man. I mean, I, 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 there's a bunch on my list. As Jay mentioned, I am guilty of having a lot of guitars, but the first part of my career was really dedicated to being a session musician. So you need all the different sounds and textures. The bottom line is though, let's not get caught up in gear. There's no piece of gear that's gonna make you sound better than you already are. Focus on your craft, writing, arranging, scoring, producing, whatever it may be. Five big credits in five seconds. Well, I just finished The Toy Box on ABC, American Idol. We're working with Vice, So You Think You Can Dance, Box Sport. Favorite color? Military green and burnt orange. Favorite food? Pizza. What more pizza? Favorite pizza topping? Pepperoni. Oh, me too. That's See, I knew you died. East Coaster at heart. See? Favorite whiskey? 
Oh, I like a, a whistle pig a rye, mm -hmm. or uh, I'm liking uh, oh Pikesville rye is Pikes. great. Love We're it. gonna go have to uh, whiskey tasting one night. Done, right. done, digging Good. it. Favorite pastime? Motorcycle riding. Nice. Hanging with my wife. She's actually really cool. I like her. Beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> she's uh, a sweet woman. She's beautiful. She's intelligent. She's got it all. She's blind. She's yeah. blind deaf. She doesn't know what she she doesn't know who I am. <laughs> so yeah. you married up, in other words, yeah, just like yeah. I did. We're so, lucky. So I know we are, dude. It's so crazy. Some schmucks from the East Coast. Uh, so yeah, man. But this is great. I appreciate it. I love you, brother. Fucking awesome. I love you too. That's a wrap for today. Be sure to leave a review and subscribe to the Career Musician Podcast. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man. Okay, Nomad signing off, but before I do, I just want to recap. What's our takeaway today from this awesome interview with Jason? For me, a couple things come to mind. First of all, diversity. Second, balance. And then thirdly, self-educate. It's important that we keep these things in mind as we go along the journey of our careers. And remember, it is a journey, not a destination. Finally, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes so we can get higher ratings and I can keep these episodes coming to you. Subscribe at the Career Musician Podcast.